glad, happy day. What a glorious day. Makes you homesick, don't it? Praise God. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews this evening, chapter number 2. And as a text, I'm going to read the first three verses of Scripture. And I want to bring to your mind a thought titled, The Greatest Thing in All the World. The Greatest Thing in All the World. Let's look at the Word of God together. The Bible says, Therefore, we ought to give the much earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. You ever forgot something important? I think we all have. And I'm learning that as I've grown older that uh, there's a lot of things that slip my mind that ought not to. But notice verse 2. For the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Pray with me. Father, we're so grateful and thankful for the free gift of salvation. And I've been reminded of uh, a prayer that old brother Joe Edwards used to pray in this sanctuary, talking about the free pardon and forgiveness of sin. And Lord, we're grateful that you are a God of pardon, one that will forgive sin. Help us, Lord, not take this lightly, and help us not allow it to slip our mind. But help us to focus upon you now more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, you know, uh, we're living in uh, a great time. In fact, you and I are beholding uh, some great things in the days wherein we live. I got to thinking about that as... Uh, I began to try to put this message together. And I got to thinking about my loved ones that's gone on to be with the Lord and what would happen if somehow God would allow them just to drop back by and visit with us for just a little bit. Now, my granddaddy went to be with the Lord in uh, the early 1980s. Uh as did my daddy and uh, an uncle that was like a daddy to me. And I got to thinking about how things has progressed from the time that they left us to now. And uh, if the Lord were to allow them just to come back and see some of the progression, my daddy would wonder what them little cases is on the side of everybody's belt now. Because he, he wouldn't know what a cellular phone really, really w would be. I mean, they didn't, we didn't have them back in uh, the 1980s. Uh, we didn't have those. And uh, my granddaddy would be plumb shocked whenever he saw these, some of these tractors coming down the road now that you have to just about get off the road. Uh, granddaddy was a farmer. Uh, in fact, granddaddy probably think he was seeing a UFO or something, you know. Technology is something else, and it seems to progress day by day. And, uh, you know, uh, our generation, uh, we've been able to see man progress from uh, the automobile to space travel. And I understand there's a feller now trying to put together this organization where you can start traveling to space if you want to. You notice I said if you want to, and Marla's right, if you got the money. Uh, I, I, 
I'm not one that wants to travel this space. Not right now. Somebody asked me one time, said, well, don't you want to go to heaven? I said, I sure do. I said, but when I go, I said, I want Jesus to be the pilot. Amen? Uh, I, I do. And uh, they used to really gig me at the First Baptist Church because they'd go on mission trips and I wouldn't go. Some of them would fly to different places and uh, go out of the country and I'd say, y'all go ahead and fly if you want to. I said, the Bible says, and the Lord Jesus said, Lo, I'll be with you even unto the end of the world. He said, Lo, I'll be with you. And then we had an evangelist to come preach for us one time who reminded me that 40,000 feet is low to Jesus. I said, while that may be low to Jesus, that's high to me. And so I'm not planning to get on no airplane. I've been on one one time. It was a little four-seater. And I promised God if he'd let me get back down that I wouldn't ever get on another one. And I hadn't been on another one since. But uh, I may have to one day, but I hope not. But uh, we've, we've been able to see. And, and listen, some of these automobiles now uh, that you, you drive, you have to read an instruction manual before you know what to do with the thing. Uh, I bought one, and I, I got to look into where, uh, whenever I bought the thing, they handed me this little old thing right here. This, this, Well, that's, that's Marta's keys, but uh, they handed me this little old square box right here. And they said, that's your key. I said, that's my what? He said, yeah, that's your key. I said, I had never had a key like this. And when I got in my truck, I started looking for something that I could stick this thing in and turn it to try to crank up my truck. And the fellow said, oh, no, you don't have to do that. Said, there's this little round button in the dash. Says, you got to have that in your pocket, and you just mash that little button, and it'll crank your vehicle up. I didn't know they made such as that. And, uh, I, I mean, you know, what, what do you do when that thing tears up? You spend a pile of money. You hope that warranty stays good for a long time. Is that right? But, I mean, we have progressed. And in all the progress that we have and the way that we have progressed and everything seems to, to be, be uh, better than it's ever been before, the greatest thing known to man has to be the free pardon of sin and God's wonderful gift of salvation. Amen. I mean, as good as everything else is, the greatest thing has to be salvation. It's the greatest thing in all of the world. Well, now somebody asked me, uh, Preacher, why do you think that it is the greatest thing Salvation is the greatest thing in all of the world. Well, I'm going to give you several reasons. Number one, I believe that salvation is the greatest thing in all of the world because of who thought of it. You see, the Bible teaches us that, that God thought about it. Uh, God knew when he created this world that mankind would sin and come short of the glory of God. And because of the greatness of God, God went ahead to, and created this world and put a plan into place. You see, God in the creation of man with all its complication and with all of man's complicated systems of, in being disobedient to God, God knew that he had to come up with a great, great plan. And so he came up with a plan called salvation. And what God will do for the sinner is one of the greatest things that could ever be done for a sinner. When I preach you, what will he do? He'll save you from your sin. He'll save you from your sin. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thought that God went ahead and created man knowing that man would sin against God and he made a, he, he, he made a way of salvation. From the beginning of time, he made a way of salvation. So God thought about it. Now, the second thing that I feel like that, that makes this great thing so important is God thought about it 
but Jesus bought it. Jesus bought it. Well, now, preacher, how did he buy it? Well, he bought it with his precious blood. You see, the Bible teaches us uh, that uh, there has to be blood shed for the remission of sin. And if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when man first sinned against God, the Bible says that God slew some animals uh, and he created clothing to clothe the nakedness of, of the man and the woman. That was the first blood sacrifice. And then the sacrificial system was placed uh, into being where the high priest would go in uh, and sacrifice for the sins of, of the people. And so blood had to be shed. And so God had that perfect plan for the Lamb of God without spot or without blemish to come, to be born of a virgin, to be raised by a earthly daddy and mother, Joseph and Mary. And of course, uh, in being raised, he, he, for 33 years, he lived here. Some 33, 33 and a half. The greatest, the greatest, listen to me, the greatest gift that's been given was somebody that was willing to die in your place. Now, Jesus said this, greater man or greater had no, greater love had no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, I don't know but two individuals that's willing to lay their life down or three individuals that's willing to lay their life down for their friends. Of course, God himself laid his life down and called you friends. That's the most important. But the American soldier who is brave laid his life down to keep this country free. And it would seem like today that more and more of our law enforcement officers are laying their lives down to try to keep freedom and peace in our country today. And more and more of them are being ambushed and killed at the hands of sinful men. But uh, the greatest uh, of America came by the shedding of blood of our own men and women in many, many wars. But Jesus bought it by the shedding of his blood. What can wash away man's sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is the crimson flood of Calvary's flow that makes and sets man free. Now there's a third thing that I feel like that is very important in seeing that salvation is the greatest thing that ever happened in this world. Number three is this, because the Holy Spirit labored for it. Today is the day that we recognize Pentecost. Now Pentecost is a very significant day. Because Pentecost is a significant day in that it was the day that the Holy Spirit returned. Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go. If I go not away, the Spirit will not come. But Jesus did go away. He ascended back to the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for us. But when he went away, he sent his Spirit to and His Spirit abides with us today. And uh, Pentecost signifies that return of the Holy Spirit. They waited in that upper room and, and, and the Holy Spirit came. And friend, it's the Holy Spirit that brings us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that, that draws us. It is the Holy Spirit that labors. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sin. It is the Holy Spirit that convinces us that we are a sinner in need of a Savior. It is the Holy Spirit that converts us. It is the Holy Spirit that seals us and makes us one of the beloved. So the Holy Spirit of God labors and let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit's not an it, it's a him, amen? 
God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so many times people refer, will refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. But the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a him. He's as much God as the Father. He's as much God as, as the Son. And, and it is the Holy Spirit that draws, that draws the lost sinner to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's a fourth thing that makes salvation the greatest thing that ever happened in this world. The Bible taught it. The Bible taught it. The central theme of the entire Bible is the salvation of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you will search the scriptures from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. You'll find Jesus. You'll find Jesus. Jesus is the central theme of the Bible. Jesus and his salvation, his plan of salvation is the central theme of the Bible. The Bible gives us five test of salvation. And I want to share those five things with you real quickly. Number one, there is the water test. There is the water test. When I preach it, what are you talking about? Well, if you go all the way back over to the book of Exodus, you'll find that the children of Israel had been in bondage for a number of years. And God raised up a fellow by the name of Moses to deliver his children. And whenever God raised him up and they left Egypt, they found, that they found themselves in, in front of them, they found the Red Sea. And behind them, they found a vast army that was coming to destroy them, to kill them, and to take their lives. And Moses said to the children of Israel, Be still, for today you'll see the salvation of the Lord. And God spoke to him and he told him what he needed to do. And friend, let me tell you something. He did exactly what God told him to do. And whenever he held that rod up over the waters of, of the Red Sea, the Red Sea parted. And the children of Israel, they were able to walk across on dry ground. So we see salvation, uh, my friend, provided through the water test. God provided salvation. That is a type of the salvation that was offered through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then there is the fire test. The fire test uh, is found in uh, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't bow before Nebuchadnezzar's idol and worship his idol. So Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown into a fiery furnace. Um, the Bible says it was seven times hotter than any fire that had been known to man, so hot um, that the fire and the flames uh, destroyed, killed those men that threw the three Hebrew children into the fiery furnace. That's a hot fire. And Nebuchadnezzar was looking. And he said, did not we cast three men bound into the fire? But lo, I see four. And they're loosed and walking around in the midst of of the fire and the form of the fourth is like the son of God the form of the fourth is like the son of God so we see salvation through the fire test they loosed them they let them go and their clothing didn't even smell like smoke and then there's the lion test the lion test number three the lion test Daniel refused to pray and honor a leader, Darius, as a god. He refused. 
And there was a law signed that anybody that wouldn't bow and worship this leader, that they would be thrown into a lion's den. And they took him and they threw him into a lion's den. And I ought to be ashamed. You know, I, I, I've said to you a lot of times that, that I probably read things into the Scripture that I ought not to do. But I can just see old Daniel walking around in the midst of those lions. Kitty, come here, kitty. <laughs> come here, kitty. <laughs> No, he probably wasn't doing that, but hey, every picture you see of him, he was petting a lion. He was petting a lion. But the Bible says that God closed the lion's mouth. And then Daniel was set free. Daniel was set free. And the ones who had conspired against him was thrown into the lion's den, and they had supper, okay? There's salvation. The line test. Then there's the prison test. The prison test. Paul and Silas over in the 16th chapter, I believe about the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, uh, they're, they're placed in prison. And they're beaten and abused and placed in prison. And uh, God opens the door to the prison and uh, turns them loose. That's the, the prison test. And then there's the grave test. And probably the grave test is one of my favorite. Because here's a man by the name of Lazarus, the Bible says, who's been in that grave for a number of days, four days to be <clears throat> truthful. Now there's a reason that he was in there four days. The reason that he was in there four days is because in the Jewish mindset, they didn't, they didn't, really, they didn't really consider somebody dead if they didn't stay dead for more than three days. So Jesus tarried his coming whenever they sent him a message that Lazarus was sick. And he told his disciples on the fourth day, come on, we got to go. Lazarus is sleeping. And the disciples said, well, Lord, we don't need to bother him if he's sleeping. He's, he's resting. And Jesus said, well, I guess I'm just going to have to be playing with these old boys. He's dead. <laughs> and when they got there, Jesus asked them where they had laid him. 11th chapter of John. And listen. Jesus said, roll the stone away. And he called him by name. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that had been dead on the fourth day got up and walked out of the grave. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Well, praise God, that's salvation right there. You hear me? Amen. Knowing that we can have salvation over the grave. And that's just exactly what the Lord has promised to those who will believe. Greatest thing that ever has happened or ever will happen is the salvation of a soul. And then the devil fought it. And the devil continues to fight God's plan of salvation. You see, the devil tries to turn everybody against God's plan of salvation. The devil is against God's plan of salvation. He fights it. How does he fight it? Well, he provides a watered-down gospel. Now, I read this, and, and I, I've already forgotten the numbers. Uh, told you there were some things that slipped my mind. <laughs> Can't remember the statistics on it. But do you know that there is a vast majority of people in the United States of America that, that has the idea that everybody's saved? Not anyone is lost. Everybody is saved because they live in a Christian country. Living in a Christian country don't save anybody. Amen. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior is the only thing I know of that will save anyone. Just because you're an American citizen don't consider yourself saved. 
Just because you live a good life, don't consider yourself saved. You see, people will preach a watered-down gospel and tell you that if you're a good person, everything's going to be all right. Hell's going to be full of good people. Did you hear that? Hell's going to be full of good people. And that's sad. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. Oh, but Lord, let me tell you what I, what kind of man I was. Let me remind you of what I used to do for the church. Let me, let me remind you, Lord, I went to church every Sunday. But you never, ever ask Jesus into your heart. You never ask Him to save your soul. Not everyone, Jesus said, who calls me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. The devil will tell you a half truth. The devil will make sin look attractive. And then the last thing, I believe that it's the greatest thing in all the world. Listen. Because I got it. <laughs> Praise God, I got it. I got God's salvation. Paul said, I know in whom I believe. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And I've committed my life to him. And I've asked him to save my soul. And, and he's made a difference in my life. And I'm glad that I know that. And I know when it happened. I was just 15 years old sitting in front of a black and white television set listening to a preacher that I didn't even want to hear. And the only reason I was listening to him was because there wasn't nothing else on television. And we didn't get the three channels in them days. Channel 10, Channel 6, and Channel 8, and ain't nobody going to watch the educational channel in their right mind. So I turned it to Channel 10, and there's that preacher on television. So I said, I'm not watching no preacher. I get enough of that in church on Sunday. Yeah, I was one of them that went to church every Sunday as a boy. In fact, I tell everybody that I had a drug problem when I was a young man. I said, what do you mean? I said, Mom and Daddy drug me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. They drug me to church. And if I ever wanted, whenever I hit 16 year old, if I wanted to go to a picture show or I wanted to go do something and enjoy a little bit of time with my friends, if I missed church that week, guess what I didn't get to do? I didn't get to go. <laughs> Uh, but I, <laughs> I turned the TV to Channel 6, and the same preacher that was on Channel 10 was on Channel 6. So I had a choice to either watch preaching. I suppose been doing homework. <laughs> to either watch preaching while I was trying to do homework or watch the educational channel. I don't even remember what was on the educational channel back then. I, I seems like Captain Kangaroo was on back in them days. And uh, seems like uh, Mr. Rogers may have been on, but I don't even remember what was on. That's how much I watched the educational channel, all right? And I didn't halfway listen to what Billy Graham was preaching. But I do know whenever he got to the closing part of his message and he offered anybody who realized that they were a sinner the opportunity to get on their knees before God and ask God to save them. I do remember how God pricked my heart as a 15-year-old boy. And I remember falling down on my knees in my bedroom and asking Jesus Christ to come into my heart and my life on a Thursday night. And I remember that I couldn't wait till Sunday to come. I wanted to let everybody know in the church that I got saved. Amen. And old brother Ralph Hobbs was my pastor. Old country preacher that I, that I love so much. He's with the Lord now. And I run down that aisle that Sunday morning and I said, Brother Ralph, God gloriously saved me Thursday night. I said, I want to be baptized. Right now, he said, son, we can't baptize you now. I said, well, do it next Sunday. I want to be baptized. Friends, you can know. 
You can know. It's the greatest thing in all the world to know that one day when I close my eyes in death on this side of eternity that I won't die, then I'll wake up in the presence of Almighty God and I'll get to see Jesus. Amen. The one who made it all possible. Yes, as great as things are in our old world today, as much technology as there, there is, as much money and resources as we have, there's nothing greater than God's marvelous gift of salvation. To God be the glory. Great things He is doing and will do to the children of God and to those that accept His free gift of salvation. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your word. And now I pray that you'll use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.